happen. Where God's word is ministered, something happens. It cannot return void. Amen? It will accomplish that for which it was said. Amen? The word says in Psalm 100, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with what? Joyful singing. Why? Because the Lord says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Know that the Lord is God. When we worship this morning, we don't just worship. We worship because we know our God is God. It is He who made us and we are His. What a beautiful assurance to know that we're coming into the presence of
most of us here this morning have worshipped from the holy place. And yet there's a holy of holies where we can look right into his face. We can look right into his eyes. We can behold his presence. As we do that, everything will become shadow.
ought to be rejoicing with that person as if it's us that got healed. And when the Lord's presence shows up, it should be
stay in a place with mental ascent. God's not interested in mental ascent. Connect with Him in, with your emotions. Connect with Him with your heart. Connect with Him in spirit. Connect with Him in truth. Connect with Him in every area of your life. I love, I love.
our first love. The church has lost her first love. She's lost her first love. And God is calling us back to that first love. You know when that, your heart beats, when that person walks in the room. Where it's like breathtaking when you just know you're in their presence. You, wow. Let's get back to that first love. That's what we talked about even this morning. The second thing we talked about was trusting Him. He challenged our trust. Loving Him is never complete without trusting Him. You cannot say you love someone and you don't trust Him. Did you hear what I said? You cannot say you love someone and you don't trust them. Love completes, strengthens, overwhelmingly fulfills that love. When I say, I trust you, it opens the door to a love. It opens the door for me to say, I love you and I trust you. Love always trusts, the Bible says. Say with me, love always trusts. And God is looking for a people who trust Him in their loving Him. Anybody can say, I love you. I was speaking to a friend just in this week. And we're talking about this very subject. My question was, how can you love someone if you don't trust them? That could be infatuation. It could be a fleshly desire. But true love has trust because you become vulnerable. Say with me, vulnerable. If we cannot be vulnerable with God because I'm, I'm scared he's, He can hurt me. That robs me of my love for Him because I'm going to keep Him at a distance. You cannot connect with someone that there's a wall between you and them because you don't trust them. Amen? The walls have to come down. And my love translates itself into being vulnerable. Say you're vulnerable. And sometimes our, re our relationship with God is tainted because we're scared He's going to ask us something that's too hard. Or we're scared He's going to let us down. We're scared He's not going to answer our prayers. We, we're scared He's not going to come through. We're scared He's not going to be a God of His Word. And so I'm scared to let him come too close in case he hurts me. Anyone been hurt at least once this year? And the rest of you are a bunch of liars. You need to come and repent here. <laughs> we need to be honest with where we're at so we can get healed. Amen. Hurt. When somebody hurts us, we, our walls go up and it's like, you're only going to come this close and no more because I know you and I know what you're capable of and you're not going to hurt me again. And many of God's people feel hurt even by God the Father. Because we prayed and that marriage still fell apart. We prayed and we lost that business. We prayed and we never got that job. We prayed and we never got that girl. We prayed we never got that guy. We prayed and that situation didn't work out the way we wanted or expected it to. Come on now, let's be honest in church. And so we lose trust in God because God didn't come through in our minds. Only years 
from now we'll look back and go, man, God was so wise. How many of you have ever had that situation where you look at God, thank God that would have been a horrific situation. Amen. And yet there are times where God is saying, you can have it, but not now. This isn't the timing. There's stuff that still needs to fall into place. And, but you see, at the time, we so want what we want, we feel let down, so we lose trust. And the Bible says, in Proverbs 23, verse 4, don't trust in your own cleverness. <laughs> I love that scripture. That's such my kind of scripture. Don't trust in your own cleverness. But it says in Proverbs 28, 25, those who trust in the Lord prospers. Those who trust in the Lord prospers. God is calling us to a place of trust. And I believe one of the reasons why the Bible tells us in Matthew 24 that in the last days the love of many, the love of many will wax cold. Why? Because they didn't trust. They didn't believe God. Because in the same chapter, it says, when God, when the Lord returns, will I find faith on the earth? The thing he's going to be looking for is, will I find people that believe me? I'm at a place in my life, and I'm trusting it's not going to take all of y'all 34 years to get here. But I don't care what happens, God is God and God is true and he will, He's a God of His Word and He fulfills and He fulfills His Word. He watches over His Word to perform it. I don't care how I feel, He's still, irrespective of any pain, He's still the God who heals. He's still Jehovah Jireh. Irrespective of what goes on in my life, He is who He says He is. He doesn't cease to be who He says He is just because my circumstances are not there yet. Whew. We need to get some backbone in the church. We need to get some solidity. Not, oh Lord, I pray for a milkshake. No milkshake. Oh, God, well, God, God's not going to give me a milkshake. Are you kidding me? We're so fickle. Let's get some backbone. Let's get some faith. Let's get some standing. Let's get some be uh, believing. When you've done all to stand, stand. Those who trust in the Lord, prosperous. There's a third thing that the Lord said He wanted me to talk about this morning. And funny enough, many of the young people that went to Youthquake on Friday night, got a very similar word. And I'm going to use some of that guy's illustrations because his illustrations were amazing. A pastor's son was ministering. How many of you know when you're in the ministry, you see stuff and you experience stuff that normal people don't? Just the way it is. He was 15 years old. And his dad, the pastor, was fired in the church he asked his daddy's permission to share this by the way the whole family was thrown into turmoil the elders fired him maybe we can put another light on in the front here just one the middle ones let's put let's do the middle one maybe and the whole family, the brothers were going to him, him being the oldest and saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to live? Our world has fallen apart. How many of you have been there at least once? Not that you're fired in your church, but you were hurt in the church and in the body. And he said they had a choice. 
to stop attending church, to disconnect from the body. And there's a lot of precious people even sitting in their living rooms right now who will not attend church because they've been hurt in the body. They've been rejected in the body. And I want to apologize to anybody that's here or that's even watching us online now. For any church, any leader, any pastor, any preacher that has ever, ever hurt you. The body's growing and at times is immature. And in our immaturity, we do things that bring hurt and pain in people's lives. And that's the third point that I want to talk about. I want to talk about connecting with your family. He used a powerful illustration that many Christians Their relationship with their church is like a relationship with your restaurant. You go to your favorite restaurant. How many of you have been to your favorite restaurant and then one day something horrible happened and the quality of the food changed or the service changed and you started thinking, I don't know if I want to be here anymore. Or you, you thought to yourself, I'm not going to tip this waiter very unfriendly today and so we didn't tip the waiter we all know what the tip is right the tithe the offerings and we treat our church like a restaurant we're there and everybody everything must be perfect and he said something very powerful and I'm wanting to just use that illustration and then we'll get into what I'm wanting to share about this morning the difference between going to a restaurant and a family meal is that when a family gets together to eat everybody contributes somebody sets the table somebody else prepares the hors d'oeuvres somebody may prepare the meal and somebody else may prepare and bring the dessert and everybody contributes to a family meal and most of the time even if something goes wrong we don't say I'm never having a family meal again a week or two later we're back having another family meal because we're family it's okay that you had an off day you weren't feeling so good so you know you overcooked the beans a little bit no big deal we love you and we even love your beans and we ought to start seeing our church time together as uh, the family coming together and we arrive with what I have to contribute to make this church into what it is called to be our Sunday morning services we're going to begin to gear it towards evangelism to win souls for you to invite your friends your colleagues and so we're not going to have three hour services anymore because y'all can handle the three hour service but maybe your buddy that hasn't been to church for 10 years won't handle the three hour service you want the three hour service come sunday night and wednesday night that's our going deeper service we kind of have an ending but if you want to stay and bask and and just bask in the presence of God you can do that because I still close what time do I close on uh, eight o'clock no sorry on nine o'clock or eight thirty I close at eight thirty is it eight eight thirty or nine which one do I cl yeah okay I close at nine but sometimes the glory of God is in the place I close for those that need to go and take kids home but we still this sometimes this altar is full of bodies just laying out in God's presence you know but that's a Sunday night service but Sunday mornings we're gonna gear it towards you being able to invite your friends and go to lunch with them or take them home for lunch and your chicken didn't burn 
because the pastor was aware of what he was doing and we know that we are doing this for souls amen sunday mornings it's evangelism time it's bringing folks to church and giving them the the service of their lives amen and of course i want to encourage you to come on a wednesday night our activation and our uh, those are activation services and our uh, our services were impartation and activation getting people active in the ministry again we're busy teaching and training people and we're going to start going out hitting the hospitals vis doing visitation even from a wednesday night those that want to go out you're going to be trained you're going to know how to lay hands on the sick you're going to know how to lead a soul to christ well, that's what we're busy doing now once they trained we're going to carry on doing teaching but those that want to go out are going to go out on a wednesday night that's exciting and if you want to stay and receive, well, you can do that too. You have a choice. We'll come, we'll worship, and boom, we'll go. Those that want to go, go. Those that want to stay, stay. It's okay. We, we have end and both. Isn't that exciting? It's time. When we said we're launching, we're launching. We're launching our singles ministry this month single adults and next week I'll be talking more about that we'll give it we'll be launching the name and what it all means and what what it's about next month we're launching a young adults fellowship it's exciting things things are getting launched that's gonna be able to take care of more and more people and I could go on and on. But God is calling us to become a family. Don't see this as a restaurant anymore. Even though the food is real good. I like it every week. Even though God's presence shows up every service. Even though our worship is amazing worship it's from the heart it's real and sincere it's not a gig to any of these people I don't know if you know this it's not a gig some places it's a gig this is their calling this is their heart they call to worship and to lead us into worship is a difference to that and a gig One John four verse seven and eight says, "Beloved, let us love one another." You cannot love if there's no connection. If I don't know who you are or anything about your life, how can I truly love you? How will I know how to pray for you, how to be there for you? For love is of God, and everyone who's who loves is born of God I'll never stop loving this about our church that if we're to line all 120 140 of you up whatever however many people there are in this room you'd have you'll be amazed at all the different accents that you'll hear You'll be amazed at all the different faces you'll see. You'll be amazed at all the different cultures and backgrounds and the different continents that people come from. I love that about our church. You know why? Because none of you are going to be shocked when you go to heaven. Some people are going to go, whoa! <laughs> I didn't know your kind of people were in here. But it's not going to happen to City Bible Church people because we had this in, in on earth. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to be like, whoa, who's next door in my mansion? 
Amen. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. The Bible also says, the love of money is the root to all kinds of evil. The Bible says, show me where your treasure is, and that's where you'll find your heart. Wherever your treasure is, wherever your giving is going, you'll find your heart right there. The Bible also says in Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives free from the love of money. Keep your life free. How do you know you love money more than you love God? Well, when, you, when you're not able to let go of money when it's time to give to God. When you're not, when you're not holding on to it. I want us to get to a place where we're such... A family unit that our giving to God is without saying it's part of my life it's part of my love it's part of my delighting myself in him this is what family does we contribute We give ourselves in, te in serving, teaching the kids, greeting at the door, helping out with hospitality. You know what my little Gabriella did this morning? We walked in, we opened up. She says, Daddy, how can I help you? Maybe cleaning or something. We walked in the sanctuary and there was bottles and a few papers and stuff under the seats. I said, you want to help Daddy? She said, yes. I said, Go get a trash bag and take, c clean everything that's on the floor. Papers and stuff. She grabbed a little trash bag. This is an 11-year-old little girl. And there she's walking around, picking up papers, bottles, stuff. And I looked at her and I thought, she's being family. She's being family. She didn't once think, well, that's the deacon's job. She didn't once think, I'm not getting paid to do this. What are you going to pay me? She didn't once think, this is not my calling or my ministry. Daddy, I do cameras. I work the computer at the back. I can play guitar. You want me to do something? I can worship on the guitar. She was so happy that I asked her to pick up papers. She was contributing to the meal. Let's get to a place where what can I do to make everybody's worship experience better? Some of you are called to raise finance for the house, to, to plow money, finance into the kingdom of God. Do it with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you're out and you, you know, you're, you're working out of town and, and it's difficult for you to serve in the house, serve wherever you can. If you are around and you can serve in children's ministry and impart what you have into the next generation, let's do that. I don't want us to lose the next generation. They need you. They need me. They need us to raise them up. To teach them what we know so that they can go beyond us. Let's not think, you know, I remember when I got saved. Jesus is coming in the next three years it's the end of the end of the end times 
I went to a church where the pastor of the church got upset with me because he was talking, he was having dinner with the other pastors and I walked in with the youth and he called me. He said, Pastor Errol, when, when do you believe Jesus is coming back? I said, oh, not at least for 10, 15, 20 years. He was horrified. He says, what do you mean? I said, way too much to do. And if he came back now, we're in trouble, Pastor. I was right then and I'm right now. <laughs> It may happen, it may happen that the next generation are the ones that are going to cross the finish line. I'm believing it's us if we get off our rear ends and make it happen. It's going to take a generation of people who are going to get it right for once and for all. participating and be content with what you have because God has said never will I leave you nor will I forsake you God is looking for us to be those who contribute of course Hebrews 10 25 don't neglect or forsake the assembling of yourselves together but you know again it shouldn't be because oh I need to go I haven't been when you're delighting yourself in him you cannot wait for the doors to be open because you want to be in church when the fruit isn't there don't try and fix the fruit fix the root of the problem did you hear what I said if you're struggling with some of the fruit that's not according to the word don't try and fix the fruit fix the root the fruit will grow on its own if Going to church is a chore. The church isn't the problem. The heart is the problem. Fix the heart. The desire will be there. If giving to God is a problem. Instead of sitting and sweating it out and getting irritated every time the pastor mentions money. Fix the heart. And then when he speaks about money. You actually love it. You actually, wow, that's great. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged to believe God. I'm encouraged in my covenant with God. Number one, let's fix the delighting ourselves in the Lord. Number two, What was number two? That's right. Trusting in Him. How do we trust Him? Do we trust Him? Number three. Becoming an active member of the family. Not arriving like it's a restaurant, but arriving as someone who has something to contribute to the family. Look around you. Just look around now. This is your family. And then we have a family outside of this family that attend other places of worship. But this is family. This is the fact that God has put us here this is our family that he's entrusted to you for you to be a channel of his goodness of his love of his comfort for you and I to be his arms his hands his eyes his mouthpiece and to pray for one another to lay hands on one another to be a blessing to one another this if we cannot take care of this, how are we going to take care of the world? How are we going to take care of a thousand when we can't take care of 200? If we're faithful in taking care of the 200, God will give us the thousands. 
But we've got to change this thinking thinking. We've got to change this. Today you're hearing the, the heart of your pastor. You want to know what you're getting today? This is the heart of your pastor and I believe it's the heart of God. Even to the large churches. The message doesn't change because of size. The message is the same, irrespective. Because you can attend and then you can be an active member. Attending a church doesn't mean you're an active member of that church. If you, if you attended my family lunch, it doesn't mean you're in my family. Unless I open the door and I invite you to be part of my family. You know what our problem is? Fear. Competition. Who's going to do what? Who's going to say what? Are they going to hurt me? Are they going to take advantage of me? Are they going to hurt me? What do they want now? Fear, 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 fear. And if you don't know what that means, fear. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. Say with me, perfect love casts out all fear. Now I know this morning is very different to what we normally have. But how many of you know it's still the Word of God? You've gotten some vision of what, what, where my heart is and where, where we're going as a church. Sunday mornings is now open. This is your opportunity to invite friends and family. This is your opportunity. Let's build this church together. Folks, this is not Pastor Errol and Pastor Debbie's church. This is, this is not uh, the Mustafa church, even though my family is fully involved here. But that's because that's how they are. They, they, they only know to serve. That's all they've seen. That's all they know. That's all they understand. To them, it's a privilege to serve. And from our 11-year-old kids all the way to our daughter in South Africa and her husband, they're both serving full-time there, working with AIDS people and working with people that you and I wouldn't even want to go near because of the sickness and disease that, that's going on. Just within 100 yards of them is a squatter camp riddled with AIDS. One day I called her, and I just want to close with this, and she was weeping. And I said, what's wrong, Tam? And she said, Dad, sometimes it's very hard in the ministry. I said, why? What's going on? She said, you know how often we have people in our church, and you get to know them over weeks, months, and even years, and so many are dying with AIDS. I arrive at church. Where's Modisa? Oh, she died of AIDS in the week. Where's Peter? Oh, he died of AIDS yesterday. She says, it's very hard. You know what I don't want? I don't want us for somebody have to die before we realize how much we appreciate them. I don't know about you, but I find that very irritating. When family didn't care for somebody at all, and then they arrive at the wedding, uh, wedding at the funeral, and they're crying, oh, I wish I had spent more time. I wish I had shown them more how much I loved them and appreciated them. This is our time to do that. This is our time to get to know each other and to appreciate each other. To get to know each other. Hard to believe. But the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, has a heart. Has a life. Has some problems and issues too, you know. Sometimes we feel we're the only ones with problems and issues. The 
let's bow our heads before the Lord. I want you to get alone with Jesus. With the understanding that this is Jesus' body. This, you say, well, it's not his physical body. Yes, it is. This is where Jesus has chosen to live. This is his body. You're his hands, you're his feet, you're his arms, you're his legs. The Bible even says that the eye shouldn't say to the hand. He even goes into detail. You and I are the body of Christ, the body of Jesus. We shouldn't be competing against each other. We shouldn't be looking who's better, who's more anointed, who's this, who's more this, who's got more of that. We ought to be one family. Everything I am is yours. As I am a gift to this body, you are a gift to this body. This is your church as much as it's mine because God put you here. You're not here by accident today or any day. You're here because God planted you here. This is your church. God planted you here. And there's no going back to Egypt. I'm saying this again. There's no going back to Egypt. Don't let Egypt call you and pull you back with its leeks and onions. And you know what? It wasn't so hard in Egypt. You didn't have to fight so hard for certain things. It was just Pharaoh just gave it to you. I don't want a thing from Pharaoh. I'd rather be in the promised land fighting for what I get than get something from Pharaoh. Hello, church. And we think because we have to fight for it, that it, maybe it's not God. Maybe it was better to be in Egypt. Don't be deceived. Because Israel had to fight for, for its land. There's things that you're fighting for. It's worth the fight. I said it's worth the fight. Because in Egypt, sometimes we just had stuff. It was just given to us. And God is saying, in Egypt, you were a slave. Here, this, you're free, but you're going to fight and you're going to win. Because I've gone before you, it's yours. I've given you the land. I've given you the land. Every place on which your foot shall tread, I have given it to you, declares the Lord. That includes your family. That includes in your business. That includes in your personal life. That includes in your church. That includes in your ministry. That includes in every area of your life. Let's put our roots down. I love it when people say, I've been here for 13, 14, 15 years. That shows that there's growth, there's advancement, there's freshness. I was in a church that after, if you've been there for five years, it got stale because the pastor would Firstly, repeat the same messages. He was a teacher, that's why. There were powerful messages, but when you've, when you've heard the same end times teaching five times over, every three years, the people were done with that. Or well, the same teaching on whatever. He had subjects that he would cover. Every time he thought they need this, every two to three years, you would hear the same message. Same teaching. It wasn't a message. It was a teaching. Same scriptures, same illustration, same everything. There was no freshness. There was no flow. Even though the, there was an anointing in the house. Because God honored his heart. But that was his, that, that, that was his call, was to teach. A great teacher. But most people weren't there more than five, seven years at the most. Because, and yet we've had, we have people here that's been here since we've started. Ten, twelve, fourteen years. 
That says something. One thing you can be assured of is I'm, I'm in God's face every day. And I want to know, Lord, what do you want to say to your people? What, do you, what is your now word to your people for their now situations? So how many of you know the problem you have today may be different to the problem you had last week and two weeks ago? So I, I want to know what God is saying to me today about my situation. I want us to just get alone with God and I want you to consider those three things. Number one, what more do I need to do to delight myself in the Lord? Let's take a minute on that. Am I delighting myself in Him to my fullest potential? Do I need to get more intimate in worship? Do I need to spend more time in the Word? Do I need to attend more services? Do I need to be set free from the love of money? Because I've been delighting myself in this inheritance, in this money, in this insurance money or whatever it is that we're holding on to sometimes. And we delight ourselves in stuff. And secondly, Do I trust the Lord? Do I trust Him with my life? Do I trust Him? Do I trust His wisdom, His word, His decisions, His direction, His leading, His guidance? Do I trust Him that He knows what He's doing with me? Or do I feel like He's too busy running the universe and no time for me? For that matter, do I trust my leaders and my pastor? Now, I'm not perfect. But if I've given you reason to not trust me, please come and share with me so I can repent and make it right. How many of you know that anybody can blow it? Give me the opportunity to repent. The pastor that says he's never messed up is lying. The pastor that says he's never made a mistake, he's lying. That's the dude to not trust. But the one that says, hey, show me what, what I did wrong. Let me repent and let's, 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 go, let's move forward together. Let's grow together. I'm saying that to you. Because you cannot follow someone you don't trust. Because you don't know where he's taking you. I want to know this man has integrity with God. And like David, when he sins, he knows how to repent. Saul didn't know how to repent. You cannot trust a man that doesn't know how to repent. That was the difference between Saul and David. Saul never knew how to repent. We need to learn how to repent. How do you get it right when you mess it up? This is important. Some people never get it right. Some people get it right and they go on. Do we trust Him enough to connect with this family and say, I'm putting my shoulder to the plow here. My tithe is here. My treasure is here. My heart is here. We're going to grow this church. I'm, I am part of this family i'm going to bring everybody i know i'm going to invite people i'm going to take all those invitations and i'm handing them out i'm going to i'm going to go pick up people if i need to we're going to grow this church we're going to evangelize we're going to get souls saved pastor now that you've said sunday mornings is our evangelism time to bring folk to church i'm committed I'm with you. My heart is here. My finances are here. We're never ever going to have to struggle to pay rent again. Because I am committed. My shoulder is to the plow with you. 
I'm reaching out to you. Can we go off live stream? <laughs>